implemented so far in the work camp. We will be hopefully make it worth your time for staying all day. Uh, like I said, David Zimmerman, there's my Twitters. That's how I met a lot of you. Okay, at least Steve. Uh, but yeah, uh, hit me up. I love talking to you sometime. Uh, anyway, so let's talk about SEO. Uh, you know, we, we kind of talked about this a little bit at our panel and how there can be a lot of different SEO opinions out there. And I'm going to try to distill like what the latest things are because things change a lot. Um, but at the same time, they kind of always stay the same. And so we're trying to hit that balance of what's new and what's still the same when it comes to SEO. Now, whenever I talk about SEO, I feel I have to stop and make a little definition. SEO is one of those phrases that's thrown out a lot that uh, almost doesn't mean anything. It's used so much. Um, SEO, in my definition, is helping people find what your website has offered. Okay? They're looking for something that your website has. And SEO is making that connection between them and your website. And that's it. It's really not that complicated. However, SEO gets used in a lot of ways. Uh, sometimes I've heard uh, people ask me, David, will you SEO my email campaign for me? No, I can't. Because that's a totally different marketing channel. And sometimes people will use SEO synonymously with all web marketing. I'm not going to really talk about all web marketing today. I'm going to talk about one form of promoting your business online, which is helping people find you through the search engines. Search engine optimization. Get it? Right? Another thing SEO is not is trying to trick Google. Okay, can we just all agree that the computer processing power alone of Google outranks the brain power in this room? Let's not start to try to think of what's the secret sauce. Well, only if I made the background color and the color of my text the same color, then I can trick Google. Let's all trade links with each other. No, no. Let's not think of SEO as an attempt to try to trick Google. Let's try to think of SEO as, as like marketing. Would that be cool? Can we, can we all agree to that? Yeah. Another thing SEO is not, is it's not set it and forget it. Sometimes people say to me, hey, Dave, will you SEO this for me? It can kind of set you up for success. But SEO is really a long-term investment. It's a process. You need to follow in order to get Google to understand your site so that you can eventually get the traffic, so you can eventually connect with your customers, so you can eventually actually make money from your site, right? SEO is a process. Uh, I don't really sell products, for example, that's like, you've been SEO'd. Like, I have a magic wand. Congratulations, you've been SEO. That's not how SEO works. It's a process. It's a campaign. And so I feel like it's unfair if I don't kind of clarify what we're talking about when we talk about SEO here. I just want to get on the same page so we get all of our definitions together. And you know what you're, what you're coming to. If you want to learn how to SEO your email, then this isn't the talk for you. Uh, actually, talk to me and we'll, we'll put you straight. But that's what we're trying to get at. You following me? Does this make sense? Okay. So let's talk about SEO. And I, I like to think of SEO as, as four simple parts. And it always starts with measurement. No matter, in fact, it's almost like if we can't measure it, it doesn't really exist. Now, this isn't really an SEO thing. This is like all web marketing. This is the power of web marketing, right? We're not buying a, an ad on a bench at the bus stop and hoping someone sees it and knowing that if enough people see it, surely some of them will become customers. Like, that's, that's old school marketing. But when we do digital marketing, we should know whether that customer became a customer from the source and how many customers became a customer 
we should be able to backtrack exactly into the customer, right? That's why not just SEO, but all web marketing needs to start by measuring it. The second part to SEO is can Google crawl your site? You know, Google crawls websites all over the world to add to its index in order to even decide whether or not to serve a page in response to a query. But before it can even do that, it actually has to be able to even read your site in the first place. So we've got to make sure that our site's fundamentally set up to even be able to see. see. Now we get, finally, to what most people think of when we think of SEO. Which page set? Right? But obviously, if Google can't crawl the page, then what good is having all of our keywords optimized or whatever? And if we can't measure it, do we even know if it worked or not? But last, I think the last piece of SEO is links. What do other people say about your website? We know you're the expert. Does anybody else think you're the expert? And that's what we'll talk about the fourth piece of SEO. So let's talk about this in terms of what's changed over the last year and what you need to be doing and knowing about SEO to do it in the current algorithms. So we need to start fundamentally with measurement. And again, this isn't really an SEO thing as much as all digital marketing, but we shouldn't. Please don't pay someone for digital marketing unless you know what you're getting out of it. Please do not pay a dime to anybody unless they can tell you what's happening as a result. In fact, I would even go so far as to say, don't let them tell you what the results are. You need to set up analytics on your site. Some form or way of knowing how people are coming to your site and what they're doing when they're on your site. Now, WordPress makes this really easy. I like the Sidekick plugin. It's great. <clears throat> Fact is, some of you already have analytics on your site. If, if your developer came to my talk last year, I begged them all to never launch a site without analytics on it. Knowing that one day, you, the website owner, would want that data. You need to make sure you get that data. That is your business asset. You should own that data, and you should be insistent on controlling it and understanding it. So it's real easy if you don't have analytics on your site already, just do something like SiteKit. There's other ways to add analytics to your site. One of the bonuses of SiteKit, and by the way, again, we're not tricking Google. This is a Google product, but we're not assuming we're getting a big extra ranking by installing a Google product on your site. No, I'm not suggesting that, right? We're not trying to do it over here. But the best, one of the best parts of SiteKit is not only you get Google, you can add Google Analytics to your site easily, you can add Google Search Console. We're going to spend a lot of time in Search Console with that. The Search Console tells you how does Google understand your site. If you're going to get any, if Google's going to have any problems with anything on your site, you're going to find out here. And so this data is just as valuable to you as understanding how people are interacting with your site. Um, on, on a side note, Google Tag Manager is really awesome. You should totally be using it. Um, you can set it up SiteKit to render and use Tag Manager to serve Google Analytics that might be above your heads. I would recommend you setting it up that way. But even if you just set it up the basic ways with SiteKit and Analytics, you're going to be ahead of 90% of your competitors who haven't taken a step to build a good foundation for your SEO campaign. Search Console, even more valuable. But, how people interact with your site is cool. Understanding your bounce rates, time on page, whatever. Those, there's a lot of data in Google Analytics. It can be really overwhelming. It can almost cause analysis paralysis. Um, but if we focus on what do we really want out of our marketing campaign or SEO campaign, that help 
helps us make better marketing decisions. Now, I, I talked about this at WordCamp Atlanta, look it up on WordPress TV, on trying to develop a measurement plan for your business. But the idea is, what does your website do to make your business money? It's not rank, right? Everybody in SEO likes to talk about rank. Okay, baloney if you can actually track rank objectively and truly. Don't believe that. Because besides the fact that rank can be such a misleading metric, you can feel like you're being successful, but rank doesn't really accomplish much if no one's searching for that phrase. That's how all those email spammers who say, I'm going to guarantee you ranking number one or whatever, they basically find a term that randomly you do already rank number one for and say, see, I did it, now pay me $100. Right? And it's baloney. It doesn't help you unless that rank is producing traffic. But guess what? Traffic ultimately is a business expense. If you are so successful in your marketing campaigns that you are generating a ton of traffic, you better have a good web host and you're going to have to pay some good money for that. So in a way, traffic is more of an expense than a goal. Besides, what good is having traffic on your site unless that traffic becomes customers? So whatever a customer looks like for you before you start any marketing campaign, make sure you can track it. And Google Analytics actually makes this really easy by setting up a goal. Now you might be setting up an e-commerce goal if you're selling products on your site. A lot of us offer services. So we want to offer a, a, a lead generation goal, a form submission, right? And we should be able to, within Google Analytics, establish how many times someone attempted to contact us as a result of traffic from a particular source of traffic that maybe is a result of ranking which is a result of our efforts, right? We absolutely have to start here, or you're guessing, you're hoping. You're paying money, surely it must be doing something. No, you don't know that unless you set your goals up in Google Analytics, which starts by asking the question, what does your website want to accomplish to get more customers? Now, in this case, We've got all kinds of cool tracking. We got their main request button. Okay, they didn't need a short context form because we removed it because it got spammed. Phone call tracking. There's a system called CallRail I really like. No affiliation whatsoever except to like them. They will help you know that for every phone call you get from your website, where did that come from? Hey, you know, it's great, and a lot of people do this. They say, hey, thank you for calling me. How did you find out about me? I'm a little offended that someone asked me that. Why are you putting the efforts of your marketing effort on my shoulders? It's a little offensive. Besides, because for all my clients, we have tracking set up, it's funny that some of my clients still don't trust that, and they'll still ask. And I say, David, we got this because of Facebook. Nope, you did not. Because customers often don't know how they found you. Or it's a little more complicated of a question than to know. Or they kind of don't care and they blow you up. You know? So you need to know how your customers are contacting you so you can have an effective marketing campaign, SEO or otherwise, right? Don't spend money unless it's making you money. How do you know if that's making you money unless you can track a goal on your website? And that's the beginning of any SEO campaign, or Facebook campaign, or email campaign, or Snapchat, whatever, I don't care. The point is, you've got to measure it. But if we're going to take a moment and talk about SEO specifically, we got to measure things, and then we've got to make sure Google can read our site. So I'll take a deep breath, because this is where WordPress is great. Like, WordPress is so easily readable by Google. 
And just by having a WordPress site, you set yourself up for success because Google really reads WordPress sites very easily. If you build a custom site using React or Angular and blah, 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 well, that would be a whole other question of whether Google can even read your site. But because you're at a WordPress conference, I presume you have a WordPress site, rest assured, crawling is taken care of. Except if you don't allow Google to crawl your website. See this button? Make sure it is not checked. You know, I can pay my mortgage each month when everybody contacts me and says, Oh my gosh, David, I dropped all my traffic on Google. What do I do? This is the first thing I check. Well made developers will set up a site on the dev server, forget to give a check this to allow to tell Google, don't look at this dev site, and forget to uncheck it when they launch, right? Hey, just just do it. Like, just check it. Make sure this is unchecked. So that Google, Google is really weird. It uses these suggestions as suggestions, but somehow when it comes to WordPress, if that's checked, Google's going to kick your site out. Um, and, you know, God forbid a malicious employee accidentally check that because they don't like you. Okay, so just, just make sure Google is allowed to crawl your site, please. Save yourself a lot of money. But the second thing we need to talk about is called crawlability is the fact that Google's algorithm is moving towards mobile first. In fact, they sent out a, a, you know, a notice in their blog the last, this last week that said their goal by the end of this year is that they are evaluating the mobile version of every single website. Let me be really clear on what that means. When they evaluate whether or not to serve your site up in the search engine results, they're looking at the mobile version of your site. They're not looking at the desktop version of your site. If you have Google Search Console installed already, you can go in there and see if Google is already evaluating you according to the mobile first algorithm. This is because most of us are already using Google most things on mobile devices. And so you need to make sure you have a website that is mobile friendly. How do you know that? Google Search Console! Hey! Right? Google Search Console, under mobile usability, funny place to put it, will tell you if it has any problem viewing the mobile version of any page of your site. If there is a problem, well, it needs to be addressed. That might involve talking to a developer or designer. Um, there's other tools that this will point you towards to know specifically what the problem is. But you, you at this point, need to make sure your website is mobile friendly because at the end of this year, the entire algorithm will be looking for mobile friendly sites and only ranking sites according to the mobile experience. Now, if you're in the process of getting a website built, a lot of designers, well-meaning, really good designers, will start by showing you, here's how your website looks on the desktop system. That is, at this point, an obsolete way of doing website design. They need to start by giving you the mobile version of your site, and then the desktop. Now, that might seem like a really small detail, but the devil is in details. If you start from a mobile design and build up to desktop, you will inherently be building a more mobile-friendly site than if you try to break down a mobile site and squeeze it onto, or a desktop site, break down a desktop site and move it up to mobile. I've seen websites that loaded three versions of every image because on the mobile side it had to have a different version of the image, so it was uh, mobile first. If you're speaking with a developer or designer about a website, make sure they start from that mobile first perspective. You, if you have a website, check this to make sure Google is calling the mobile version of your site has no problems with it. While we're talking about mobile, 
we have to talk about speed. I know that speed is a really popular topic these days. I mean, everybody's talking about speed. Speed isn't the ranking factor. It is a ranking factor. Of hundreds of ranking factors, of which we don't know which is the most important one. So don't obsess on speed. However, whether you're doing SEO or not, speed has a way of improving your experience with your customers visiting your site, has a way of improving conversion rates on your site. So speed is a very productive use of time. You need to make sure your site loads fast. Now, we can get into all kinds of specs. The short version is most people won't wait three seconds for your site to load. That's kind of what you're aiming for. But three seconds is very subjective. If you're looking at a site through your mobile phone here today, three seconds might be different than looking at it from your desktop system than it might be looking to it from work than it might be on your iPad. Right? So time is not a really good way to judge speed because that is a lot of things play into that that are not really in your control. Thank you, Search Console, for telling us how well our site performs. This is a new thing that they've released very recently, hence they call it experimental. That tells you how well your sites are performing speed-wise. Caveat, I have never seen a website perform well according to this report. <laughs> Ever. I work with a lot of developers. We work really hard to make websites run really fast. And for some reason, this report just never likes it. I'm predicting Google is going to improve this report. They're just saying, hey, we're busy doing other stuff, so they tag it experimental so they can have some culpable deniability, right? But this is a great way to start, anyway. Look through this. What, what I recommend my clients do is aim for less red first. What happens when you get less red is typically you'll get more yellows. That's OK. It's really hard to get greens. This is a website we actually worked in January to get more greens. And it worked for a little bit, and then this report decided that it didn't like it for some reason. Again, this is a tool to start with. This is not the end of all things. So, because I'm really not trying to talk to developers, I don't want to get technical about page speed, but let me give you some advice that anybody can do to improve your speed on your site. First thing is imagery, right? I know that 10,000 pixel wide, 10 megabyte image is beautiful. Ain't nobody got time to wait for that to load on their mobile site. Only use images as large as you need them to render on the page. Okay? There are plugins you can use that can help shrink these down. WP Smush or is it WP Smush? Smush. It's a great one. I use it in Imageify. Uh, anyway, just watch your image sizes. That really affects page load speeds. Another thing that causes a lot of problems with speed is poor web hosts. I, no one sponsors me to come to work here, so I'm not going to recommend a web, uh, as a web host. Hey, funny how that works. <laughs> but oftentimes, you get what you pay for. Right? You buy the $10 a month plan from a web host. It's shared. It's not going to do very well. Sometimes you need to spend a little more money for your host. But guess what? You know how much of your marketing efforts are paying off because you set up analytics and you're tracking your goals. So now it's not an expense as much as a justification to make more money. Because you started by setting up your analytics properly, to track your goals, to see how many customers you're getting, you know, about how much you make from your customers. Now it's an opportunity to make more money by paying for a better web host. Another thing with WordPress especially is, is those plugins. Like, if you're not using it, remove it. Um, don't deactivate it and leave it in there. A lot of these plugins are poorly coded. 
So you need to deactivate the plugin and remove it. Because if you just deactivate it, sometimes it'll actually keep the code on the page. It's really strange. That's some of these work. But the best advice I've ever heard on page speed, and this is something anybody can do, is the fastest thing to load on any page is the item you don't put on it. Do you need a 10 image slider on your homepage? Do you? I mean, really? Nobody cares. Like, take it off, right? Just ask yourself does this whatever widget, video, image, plugin, anything really make you more money? If not, no matter how much you love it, maybe you should take it off. There's a lot of talk about accessibility when it comes to SEO. I better check my time, but I'm not even halfway through yet. Let me just say that accessibility is an important concept that we should all consider. But I think Google is making an issue of accessibility that has nothing to do with WordPress. There are a lot of developers who are building JavaScript framework websites that are inherently not readable by screen readers and are inherently not accessible. And this is Google's way of saying, hey guys, when you're building those websites, make sure people can read it. The fact is, a lot of the things that make accessibility work, WordPress does out of the box. But not everything. So let's, rather than alienate people, let's include more people that could potentially, we could help through our business. And let's take some time and work on accessibility. And I think what you'll find is you're accidentally working on SEO at the same time. There's a, a, an audit tool I like to use called web.dev. Um, they had a little accessibility report. Oh my gosh, David, your website, or like Lancorn, has an 85 SEO score. Why am I listening to you? Who cares? Right? This is actually the worst SEO score metric out there. This offers you no value. Um, I do fine with an 85 score. But for accessibility, performance, which is speed, best practices, which is often security, throw your website, a web page, into web.dev and see what Google has to say about it. There might be some opportunities for improvements, reaching new customers. So, SEO is a measurement. Once we know how people are finding us and that they're becoming customers, we want to make sure Google can even crawl our site. Once we know Google can crawl our site, now we're getting to what most people think of as SEO, content. This is where I have a lot of fights with developers, or designers especially, because designers don't like words. But Google means words. Google fundamentally is using the words of your page to determine what your page is about. Now, I like a good image. I'm a very visual thinker too. But if I see an image of a lawnmower on your website, I don't know why that's there. Do you sell lawnmowers? Do you service lawnmowers? Do you really just appreciate a good lawnmower? I don't know what that image means. I need words to explain to me what it is that you do with lawnmowers if you want me to be your customer. Don't think that images versus words on your pages. You need to make sure and speak your customer's language if you want to be shown up in Google. Now, whenever I say that, people say, well, how many words do I have to have? Which, to me, is an interesting question because it's trying to get away with as little as possible. And if you really force me to, don't force me to, but if you really force me to, no less than 500 words on a page. And I'll say, that number is arbitrary. Because really what you should do is write about the topic, knowledgeably. 
as an expert. You're an expert. Write about it knowledgeably. I think what you'll find is if you write with your expertise, the page is going to be fairly long. Closer to a thousand words. You can write a thousand words on the topics about which your business is about. You're a big expert in your business. Now, I'm not saying you need to vomit a thousand words on your page. Break it up. Use headlines. Use bullets. Use images within the text. But you need a significant amount of content in order to show up in Google. And there's a number of reasons for it, um, which I can't get into right now. My talk at WordCamp, WordCamp Asheville from last year goes into that in a little more depth. I hope that will help you. However, when I talk about words, I'm going to talk about Yoast. I love Yoast. Great plugin. You alluded to that. But we can't not talk about Greenlight. And kind of like I alluded to in the panel, I have a love-hate relationship with that green light. What I like about the green light in Yoast is that it makes sure you're focusing on every page on something. Focus is good. If you're trying to rank for some topic, putting that word on every page of your site doesn't help you. Every page should have a clear focus. The problem with the Yoast green light is obsession. People will become obsessed with that green light. And I've seen them make some major SEO mistakes to try to earn that green light. But the biggest problem with Yoast green light is that Google isn't looking at keywords anymore. Google is thinking about your pages from a topical perspective. It used to be, in old school SEO, we built a page, if you were a law firm, for your lawyers, a page for your attorneys, a page for your law firm, a page for lawsuits. All right, like, we're again, we're not trying to trick Google anymore. Google knows it's the same thing. So we build one focused page. And we might mention lawyers, and sometimes people call them attorneys, so we might mention that on there. And Obviously, these people do lawsuits, so we'll talk about that. But think topic, not a specific word on your page. What you'll end up doing is talking about things that Google wants to see accompany your topic. If you're a law firm, you didn't talk about cases or judges or precedents, then that would be a little odd. Well, how do we know? Well, so if you write for a thousand words, what you'll end up doing is you'll be including these other related phrases that Google is really looking for in the page. But if you do the minimum, it's going to be really hard to, you're going to squeeze your keywords in there too much. Follow me. This is a little, I'm, I feel like I'm not being very specific. Whenever I talk about content, inevitably people say, that's a lot of content, so I'm going to cut corners. No. Like, they will, I've seen some crazy stuff before. I'm going to say the same page, but I'm going to replace the word lawyers with attorneys in the same content. All right, that page is ranking number one, so I'm going to take their content, put my content, put it on my side, and change my company name. No, that's silly. That's trying to trick Google. Let's not try to cheat. Take the time to write me content. But, and this is one of the problems within WordPress. WordPress has a way of duplicating your content if you're not careful. If you've ever noticed on some WordPress blogs, you can read a post, that you go to the category page, the entire post is still there. You go to the tag page, you can read the entire post on that page. You go to the date page, you read the entire post on that page. Have you seen that? You're basically giving Google three or four copies of your content. And you're duplicating it on your own site. There's all kinds of problems with doing it that way, but WordPress has an easy solution. Then read more tech. Use it. Um, go in there, a couple paragraphs, a couple sentences. And that, what this does is it prevents your entire post from appearing on an archival page. And if someone wants to read the entire post, they have to go to the actual post page. 
Now, if you're a developer, there's a way to do this in the functions.php file, so you don't literally have to add this on every blog post you ever write. But if you don't, you can at least do this to prevent the entire post appearing on every archival page you have. Hence, preventing duplication on your site. This helps Google focus on the landing page that you want people to land on in response to the queries. So I have asked eloquent about images and how images are bad, but they're not. Um, last year in Google I.O., uh, they spent two-thirds of their time talking about imagery. This is because what's going on is a lot of people are going to Google image search to search for services. Not just products, for services. That's the first place to go because they want to see the pictures. Personally, I think this is Google trying to compete with Facebook and Amazon and Instagram, which is a very image-centric method. So, what does that mean for us as WordPress users? We got to use the featured image. And I'm breaking my own rule here. We kind of can't get away with soft images anymore. Take the time, take a nice picture. It's relevant to your topic. Put it in there as a featured image. Why is this important? Because Google's moving mobile first. Have you ever done a Google mobile search recently? They're actually inserting images next to every search engine result in mobile searches. Where are they getting them? Featured image. You don't have a featured image on your page, you're just getting the blue links. Maybe in the description. So take some time. Add a featured image. Where this helps too is Google's, one of Google's latest products, Google Discovery, where Google on mobile devices is actually answering questions before you know you need to know the answer to it. They are suggesting what it thinks you need to know. And that is very image-centric. So if you want to be served, well, so first of all, let's just be clear, not everyone qualifies for Google Discovery, but if you want to even have a chance, you have to be using the feature images. Schema. Schema is a way kind of invisibly coding things with search engines that most humans don't see. Um, it's a way of helping Google understand what a page Contains. So, for example, if we see three numbers, a dash, three numbers, a dash, and four numbers, we typically know that's a phone number. But it could be any number of things. We can encode that as schema, and Google immediately identifies that as a phone number. Right? We humans are really good at um, understanding patterns. The computers aren't. So schema helps the search algorithm understand what each thing on your page is about. Now, there's a lot of uh, schema do's and don'ts. In fact, over the last year, a lot of things changed with schema. Google has removed organization schema and has cracked down on review schema. Uh, you can't have review schema on your site unless you're selling a product. And even then, they're being very strict. You will get a nasty gram in your Google Search Console if you try to cheat Google or put review schema on your site. However, there is still a lot of great schemas. But thank you, Yoast. This is one of those things that Yoast does out of the box, right? That you have to think about it. And if you go in the Google Search Console, you can see the results. There's my mobile usability. Uh oh, I have a page that's not mobile friendly. I'll fix that when I get home. Logo. Notice it's getting smaller as Google stopped acknowledging organization schema. Site link search box. That is what we call what they call the website schema. Yeah, I don't know why there's a schema on a website saying this is a website, but there is, and Yoast installs it for you automatically. Um, what happens is, if your website has enough traffic, you will get a search bar for your site within the search results. 
Now, not everybody earns that, but to have that even as a possibility, you need website schema. You also put that on there for you automatically. Oh, back to schema. One of the things I really like about Yoast is that it adds what's called article schema to your blog posts. This is a way of saying, hey, this is an article. Here is the title. Here is the featured image. Here is the content. This is when it was written. It tells Google a lot of information about it. Um, this also is one of the factors behind Google Discovery. But it also just, it's one of these weird things Google does not obviously talk about SEO very much because they make money from paid search, not from SEO. But for a while, in the, in the schema guidelines in Google, it said we will actually rank your page better than article markup. I don't know if that's true anymore. I kind of am a little suspect that that's the truth. Again, I'm, my strategy is not to trick Google, so I'm not trying to follow the latest thing, but if you can add it by the plugin Yoast that's already adding it to your site, well, great, why not? So, SEO is about measurement, crawling, content, and links. This is fundamentally what made Google a better search engine than the others, and why we don't really talk about Bing. Although Bing is all, uses a very similar algorithm to Google these days. <clears throat> Let's just think about what a link represents. If we go into a room, and there's a lot of plumbers in that room, who's the best plumber? Is it the plumber who has a plumber on his hat, on his shirt, on his business card, on his truck outside? And the plumber who says plumber more than the other guys in the room who say plumber? Or is it the plumber who everyone in that room knows, that person there, she's the best plumber? Right? Clearly, that's the best plumber. That's what a link does. A link is a vote of credibility from one site to another saying, that one there? They are the experts. It's not about just optimizing the content of your site. That's how Google knows what your page is about. But not how Google decides who is the authority on that topic of that page. Danger, 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 danger. We gotta be really careful when we talk about link building because we all get these spam emails, I'll bet you a thousand links to your website. Don't do it, that's a great way to get your website kicked out of Google. Quality over quantity. Think like a PR firm. Why on earth would anybody link to your site? What do you have to offer that no one else has? What is the unique selling proposition of your business? These are the kind of questions you have to ask as you try to find reasons why someone would link to your site before you even begin the process of trying to get people to link to your site. But while we're talking about links, one of the good news is, is that Google really cares about internal links within your own site. This, what I've heard referred to as a hub and spoke system, where you have a page focusing on one topic, and then perhaps the blog posts relating to that topic, all linking back to the main page for which you think is the best page to sell that service or product on. I typically, within WordPress, use a page as the page that is trying to attract and make the sale, and these blog posts to talk broadly about a topic, oh, and by the way, I offer that service. Linking to the main page for that topic. This is used by Google to determine what page on your site is most important for that topic and pass the juice to those pages as you build links to your site. Don't neglect this. Yes, has a, a measurement in their pages saying how many links are going to each page. If you have pages that aren't getting links, even from your own site, start Errors. Search Console will tell you under, what do they call it, coverage report, if Google's having any problems understanding the page of your site. 
One of the most common things as it relates to links is if someone's linking to a page that doesn't exist on your site any longer, you're no longer getting credit for that link. Oftentimes, clients are calling me frantic. I just launched a new site. It's beautiful. No traffic from Google. That's because the developers did not make sure to install 301 redirects in the old version of the URL. I worked really, really hard to make sure some of my clients didn't change a single character of their URLs just to avoid having to do redirects. The page can change. If the URL changes, you have to use a 301 redirect to make sure the link authority to that old page passes to the new page. This is where you will find it. Make sure you do it. You can go overboard. But this is probably the first place you'll find it outside of a third party tool for that place. So that's SEO. Can you measure it? It is accomplishing something that helps your business. Then can you crawl your site? Do your pages talk about things that your customers are looking for? And does anybody else think you're an expert in the field? This is just the beginning. SEO isn't set it and forget it. This is something you have to kind of go back into again and again and again and have to keep up with. But that's the foundations of, of a good SEO community. So I hope that helps give you some perspective. Uh, I'm developing this tool. This is the time where I get to plug. So the SEO game I'm going to be walking people through this. I'm just starting on this thing. So I'm looking for beta testers. Sign up for free. Tell me where it sucks. That's the only thing I ask. But otherwise, get in touch with me on the Twitters. I can take some answers briefly, I think, or I'll be around for a little bit later. But I can't take any questions. I talk too long. So thank you for showing up. Talk to you soon.